Now, in chapter 39, the scene shifts to Egypt. The scene shifts to Joseph. And now the focus will be on Joseph for the rest of the book of Genesis. Joseph is a slave. Joseph is rejected. Joseph is unloved. Apparently, Joseph has lost everything. He loses his family. He loses his country. He loses even any knowledge of what's going on in his family. He loses his freedom. He's an alien, an exile, an outcast, and a slave. And we find him as a slave in the home of this man Potiphar. Genesis 39, verse 1. Joseph has been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites. So now he's been sold twice. He's been sold by his brothers, and now he's been sold by the Ishmaelites. So he's alone in Egypt. But look at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. He's not alone. You can take a cork. You know what a cork is. That's that little thing you, you put on the top of the bottle to seal it. You can take a cork and you can hold a cork under water, but it'll come right back up. A cork cannot sink. You hold it down, but it can't sink. Joseph is like that. You can hold Joseph down, but he won't sink. Why won't he sink? Because God is with him. His brothers may sell him. The Ishmaelite, Ishmaelites might buy him. The Ishmaelites might sell him. You can take him into Egypt, but he's not going to sink. He's not going to sink and disappear in Egypt because God is with him. God makes him a successful man. Here's what that means. Nobody can hold you down. Nobody. But God can hold you up. Nobody can make you unsuccessful. But God can make you successful. Everything depends on your relationship with God. Maybe your relationship with other people has been painful. Maybe your relationship with other people has been unfortunate. Maybe your relationship with other people has been unsuccessful. That doesn't matter. That will not determine your life. That will not shape your destiny. The only thing that matters is your relationship with God. That's going to determine who you are. And that's going to hap determine what happens. You see, Joseph's brothers tried to write his story. But they couldn't write the end of his story. They could give him pain, they could give him in inconvenience, they could give his, him trouble. But they could not write his story. They especially could not write the end of his story. Only God can write your story. Only God can write the end of your story because the whole world, our whole lives, is a play, is a drama. And God is the author. Your parents aren't the authors. Your enemies are not the authors. You are not the author. God is the author. He will write the play. He will write your story. He will write in your part. And He'll write the end of the story. That's what He did for Joseph. And that's what He'll do for you. So this is not just a story about somebody else. This is the story about somebody who knew God, the same God that you can know and the same God that I can know. Jacob will die. We will see that in the book of Genesis. Joseph will die. We will see that in the book of Genesis. But God doesn't die. The same God, the God of Jacob, and the God who was with Joseph in Egypt is alive. And that God is your God and my God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's a slave. 
He's a slave in Egypt, but God does not abandon him. God is with him. God is the God of eternity, which means that God was the God of who was the God of the 19th century B.C. in the ancient Near East, is also the God of the 21st century A.D. And God is the God of the universe, which means that God is not only the God of Canaan, but He's the God of Egypt. And He's the God of Russia. The same God who doesn't die and who doesn't restrict himself to one little geographical area. Same God. And it says that um, the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. Verse 2. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And people noticed that God was with him. Verse 3 says, His master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, that is, favor in the sight of Potiphar, the head of Pharaoh's guard, verse 4. So he became the personal assistant of Potiphar. And Potiphar put him in charge of everything in his house, all that he owned, he put into the possession of Joseph. That is, he gave Joseph the key. Joseph had the key to everything that Potiphar owned. That's how much Joseph, that's how much Potiphar trusted him, trusted him. He was over his bank account. He was over his money. He was over his possessions. He was over his house. He was over everything. He trusted him. And Potiphar was blessed because he trusted Joseph. Everything turned out well. Everything in his house, everything in his, in his field, his flocks, his personal possessions prospered because he put Joseph in charge of everything. And God was with Joseph. Now, um, we don't see this very much in the Bible, but we see it sometimes. We see it with David. We see it with Rachel. We see it with Absalom. We see it with Esther. And we see it with Joseph, verse 6. Joseph was good-looking. His brothers hated him. He was a slave. He was an outcast. He was an alien. But he had two things in his favor. God was with him, and he was good-looking. But the fact that he was good-looking um, got him into trouble because Potiphar's wife also noticed that he was good-looking. And Potiphar's wife was a seductive, immoral woman. And she tried to get him to commit adultery. And he wouldn't. She says in verse 7, lie with me. Come, let's lie down together. Verse 8, but he refused and he said to his master's wife, behold, with me here my master doesn't worry about me. He's given everything over to be my responsibility. There is no one greater in this house than I, verse 9. He's withheld nothing from me except for you because you're his wife. How then can I do this great evil and sin? Does he say, how can I do this great evil and sin against Potiphar? No. He says, how can I do this great evil and sin against God? Look at verse 10. She spoke to Joseph day after day, but he did not listen to her to lie beside her, her or to be with her. Back in chapter 3, we talked about the fact that, that um, Eve listened to the serpent. And yesterday we talked about the fact that fear is determined by what we focus on, what we listen to, and so is faith, Romans 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He didn't listen to her. He refused to listen to her. Now there, there are two or three things here. Remember, we're studying the history, the narrative. What does the story say? We're also studying the theology. What does it say about God? 
we're also studying the spiritual reality. How are we supposed to respond to who God is and what God does? And we're also studying the practical application. What are we supposed to do in response to what God does and in response to what our relationship is to God? Well, there's some spiritual lessons here that we ought not to miss. The first spiritual lesson is this. What do you do when God disappoints you? What do you do when you expect good things because you worship God and you know God and you're His child and He's your Father, but good things don't come, bad things come? What do you do then? Do you stop trusting God? Do you stop serving God? Do you say, you know, I expected the Christian life to be one thing. I expected it to be an easy thing and a pleasant thing, but it's not an easy and a pleasant thing. It's a hard thing and it's a painful thing. Therefore, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I don't want to follow God anymore. I'm going to renounce the God of the Bible because I didn't think it was going to be this hard. And it is hard. Therefore, I'm finished. I'm not going to do this anymore. Well, Joseph received some assurances from God, didn't he? Joseph had a dream. And in this dream, he was above his brothers and he was looking down at his brothers. Did that happen? No. His brothers threw him into a pit. And in chapter 37, he's in the pit looking up at his brothers. So, not only was the dream not fulfilled, but the opposite happened. Instead of him looking down at his brothers, he was looking up at his brothers. And also, in the dreams, Joseph was promised that he would be a ruler. Was he a ruler? No. He was a slave. So at this point in the story, it appears that God had not kept His promise to Joseph. Now, a woman comes along. I don't know if she was good looking or not, but probably she was good looking because her husband was an important official in the court. Those kinds of men are rich. Those kinds of men are powerful. Those kinds of men can pick any kind of wife they want. So probably she was beautiful. So here's a woman who is beautiful, and here's a woman who is powerful, and here's a boy who's 17 or 18 years old. And all his hormones are screaming, go, 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 go. But he knows that God is saying, no, 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 no. So who does he listen to? What happened when he listened to God? His brothers hated him. His brothers rejected him. And he became a slave. So apparently it doesn't do him much good to listen to God. He thought God was powerful. But God has not shown the power to keep him from suffering, to keep him from slavery, to keep him from the pit, to keep him from Egypt. Now this woman, she really is powerful and she wants to have sex. This woman can make his life wonderful or this woman can make his life miserable. Who does he listen to? Does he listen to the powerful woman or does he listen to God who apparently did not keep his promise. Now there's something else here. There's, there's the comparison with Judah. Judah has had a woman. Judah has had a wife. Judah has had three sons. Judah's wife dies and for a few days he doesn't have a woman. So when he sees a woman on the side of the road, the very first time, bam, she takes him down. First time. He sees a woman who thinks he's a prostitute. Immediately he goes to make a deal with her and have sex with her. The first time. 
Now here's a young man who's never had sex. He's never had a wife. He's never had a woman. And he's about 17 or 18 years old. He's dying for a woman. Here's a beautiful, powerful woman who's right there in the house, who can protect him, who wants him. Judah goes down the first time, the first time. Day after day after day, he comes to her. It says um, that she didn't stop, that she kept asking him, verse 10, day after day, day after day, day after day. Judah goes down the first time, but day after day, day after day. Joseph says, no, I'm not going to sin against God. Maybe God has not kept his promise yet. I'm not going to sin against God. Now here's the question, Christian. How long does God get? How much time are you going to give God? How long are you going to give him to come through for you? How long are you going to wait until you decide, I'm not going to serve God anymore. I'm going to serve myself. I'm not going to listen to this God. I'm going to listen to this woman. You see this man, Joseph. You see how special he is. You see how different he is. You see how great he is. God did not God allowed Egypt, God allowed Joseph to go down into Egypt, but God did not allow Egypt to go down into Joseph. God allowed Joseph to be with the Egyptians, but God did not allow Joseph to be like the Egyptians. You see that God is with Joseph. And that's enough. Joseph lost his family, but he didn't lose God. God was enough. Joseph lost his country, but he didn't lose God. God was enough. Joseph lost his freedom, but he didn't lose God. And God was enough. Joseph proved that God was enough. Is God enough for you? Do we love God for who He is, or do we only love God for what He gives us? We only love God if He gives us sex, if He gives us family, if He gives us freedom, if He gives us the kind of job we want, or do we love God if He says no to immorality? If we lose our freedom, if we lose our family, if we lose our country, is God enough? Do we still love God? This is the great thing about Joseph. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. And then Joseph was punished for doing the right thing. His suffering gets worse. Now here's an amazing thing. Um, Finally, she decides that she's not just going to use words, but she's going to use physical force. In chapter 34, we saw Dinah raped, Joseph's sister. In chapter 39, we see a woman try to rape Joseph. Hard to do. It's hard to rape a man. But she caught him. She grabbed hold of his clothes and she said, you lay down with me right here. And he runs away. And when he runs away, his clothes come off. I don't think they wore underwear in, in those days. So this must have been very embarrassing to run out of the house with no clothes on because she's got his clothes in her hand. So she calls the other servants in and says, Joseph tried to rape me. Here's the proof. Here are his clothes. He took his clothes off and I grabbed them and, and screamed and, and he ran out of the house. And I can prove it. 
Ask him where his clothes are. So, uh, her husband comes home. Verse 19. It says in verse 19 that his anger burned. He became very angry. Now, I can't prove this. I know that he was upset. And I guess he was upset with Joseph. But I believe the longer he thought about it, the more he did not believe her story. This is not a stupid man. This is a man who rode to the, rose to the top in Egypt. This was a man who became Pharaoh's personal assistant, Pharaoh's personal bodyguard. And he rose to the top because he could read the character of men. And he had already read the character of Joseph. He knew Joseph. And he also knew his wife. And the more he thought about who Joseph was, and the more he thought about who his wife was, I'm sure the more he wondered if that story was really true. Now, again, I don't know. I'm just guessing. But I think there, I think there is one bit of evidence in the story which makes me think that Potiphar did not believe his wife. And that is the fact that he didn't kill Joseph. He did put him in prison. And I think he probably had to put him in prison to have peace at home and not to humiliate his wife and also not to humiliate himself. You see, if he believed Joseph's story and not his wife's story, that was a very humiliating thing for him for everybody to know that his wife was trying to seduce somebody else, even though she was his wife. That really, really made him look bad. So there were lots of reasons why he had to pretend to, to um, believe Joseph, even though uh, he had to, pre to pretend to believe Potiphar's, to, to believe his wife, even though Joseph was telling the truth and he probably knew it. And I, I think that probably when he took him to the prison and, uh, and he put him in the prison, uh, he probably said to the jailer, take care of this boy. He's good. He's rare. Keep an eye on him for me. I don't know that he did that. But I do know that the jailer knew that Joseph had favor with God. It says in verse 29, 21, we see it for the second time, the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. Now think about that just for a moment. Let's say we don't have sexual opportunity. We don't have the opportunity to enjoy that part of life in a righteous way. The only way we can enjoy that part of life is in an unrighteous way. Let's assume that that's our situation. And let's say that we are so godly and we love the Lord so much that we say no to that relationship until we can enjoy it in a godly way. Well, let's hope that we would be that strong. Let's hope that we'd be that faithful. But now here's another question. What if by saying no to ungodliness we gained the reputation for being ungodly. What if I said no to an immoral sexual relationship, but in saying no to immorality, I receive the reputation as a rapist? And everybody thought I was a rapist. And I went to prison as a rapist. Think about that. So that by purity, by godliness, by morality, by keeping God's law, by doing the right thing, I not only lost the opportunity to enjoy sex, but I lost my freedom. 
and now I'm a prisoner in prison. First I was a slave out of prison, now I'm a slave in prison. And not only that, but I gained the rep reputation of a criminal and a rapist. Think about that. Think about what Joseph was willing to suffer to do the right thing. I don't know if Oscar Wilde was a Christian because he did some very bad things. He did some very immoral things. And he actually went to jail for it. He died in 1900. He died 110 years ago. Oscar Wilde was a very clever, very witty man. And he said something very, he said many things very clever, but one thing he said was this, no good deed goes unpunished. And what he meant by that is if you do the right thing, you're going to suffer for it. No good deed goes unpunished. Joseph did a good thing. Joseph did the right thing. And Joseph was punished for it. Boy, was he ever punished. We've come to the end of chapter 39, which finds Joseph in prison for doing the right thing. And it says that in verse 21, again, we see, but the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord extended kindness to Joseph, gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. So just as Joseph had been put in charge of everything in Potiphar's house, he, had also, he was now put in charge of everything in the prison. It says that God gave Joseph favor with the jailer, just as God gave Joseph favor with Potiphar. We have to ask ourselves the question, um, God gave Joseph favor with his father, but he didn't give Joseph favor with his brothers, and his brothers were able to hurt him. God gave Joseph favor with Potiphar, but Joseph had the wrong kind of favor with Potiphar's wife, and she tried to hurt him, and she did hurt him. Now he's in prison, but he receives favor with the jailer. Here's the question. Why doesn't God give us favor with everybody? Because we're not in heaven yet. We're still in a bad place. We're in a bad place with bad people. Some of us will have the favor of a long life. Some of us will have the favor of getting to go to heaven early. Some of us will have one kind of favor. Some of us will have another kind of favor. But the fact is the Lord is with us, and He will show us the kind of kindness that He chooses for us. It's better that God choose our blessing than if we choose our blessing. If we choose the blessing, it will only do us good for a little while. If God chooses the blessing, it will do us good forever. This is one of the main things we trust God with. We trust Him with what kind of blessing He gives us. So many times we get one kind of blessing, but we want another kind of blessing. Um, so verse 30, chapter 39 ends with this amazing sentence. The Lord was with him. We've been told that three times already. The Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made him to prosper. Now, we're told in verse um, 20 that Joseph has been put in a special prison. He's been put in a prison for the king's prisoners, the Pharaoh's prisoners. 